first artist now uh, busy lecture for the semester, so good to see everyone. Um, let me um, tell, tell folks how we usually structure this, although we're always open to diversions when people come and present. But for the students who are enrolled in this class, this lecture series, which is free and open to the public, so please encourage uh, other friends, faculty, colleagues, relatives, across the University City, Southeast, Southeast Wisconsin, to come to this lecture series. It's, it is a great public uh, program for all of us, and one of the best visiting artist series you'll find anywhere in this region. So uh, please promote it and spread the word. I've started to see a lot of, uh, uh, you know, you can always find the whole lineup on the Tech School of the Arts website. I'm starting to see talks shared on social media, and that's great. We have, what, 250 plus seats? So by all means, uh, there is a class in association with this lecture series that I teach. It is a Art 105, 309, 509 class. So there's 50 plus 60 students uh, here tonight that's in this class. This is your first uh, visiting artist from this series. So what typically happens is the artist, it is uh, his or her floor um, to present for an hour, hour and 15 minutes or so. Um, you know, Artists present in multiple ways. Sometimes they show us a back catalog of work, sometimes present work, sometimes influences. What's neat is it's always different, and probably each visiting, each visiting artist presents differently uh, you know, every month or so that they're presenting. So it's always unique, always a surprise, and a wonderful surprise to all of us. But for about an hour or so, the visiting artist presents. Sometimes the visiting artist says it welcomes questions, during, or sometimes at the end, but we always like to leave in at least 15 minutes, 20 minutes of dialogue where you folks are asking questions and asking uh, direct questions uh, to the artists. So that is something that, that has, we've done well for the last four or five years with this program. So please, let's follow that. I usually ask the visiting artists to try to uh, finish up their presentation with around 8.15 questions around 8.30 so that you folks can take a break around then. My class breaks for 15 minutes, and then we come back at 8.45 and stay here until 9.30 and I present uh, a different lecture to my class based on our readings and what we're focused and studied on. So, um, so those of you in my class, um, it is a public lecture today, but you'll see everyone get up and leave at the end of the uh, presentation by by our, our guests, but then you folks will come back around 8.45 or so. Also, uh, feel free to come up and talk to our guests during break. Um, so please, dialogue with the, art, with the artist. Uh, it's a great one-on-one -on -one interaction. A couple other things. Uh, my TA, Ibrahim Gambari, is filming these lectures. So uh, you will see within a day or two that this lecture will be up on the Artist Now YouTube channel. You'll see an archive of at least a couple of years of visiting artist lectures, so uh, so that is something you can explore as well. Other than that, I think that's uh, the list that I have. What I tend to do is also um, promote what's coming up next week. We have a really full schedule this year, so uh, we don't have visiting artists every week uh, of the semester, but we do uh, have, a, have a pretty busy schedule in September. So next week, September 17th, we have Trudy Benson. Let me read you a brief description. Uh, Trudy Benson is known for large-scale abstract paintings that utilize large swaths and globs of paint. Her style is influenced by early computer painting programs such as Mac Paint and, and Windows Paint. That um, shall be fascinating. The week after that, we have M12, where my guest is a rural art collective from uh, Colorado. They're bringing six people to present, and I'm being told they're bringing guitars as well. So I have no idea what to expect uh, for that. But I'm hyping up these next two weeks because it's key to see them all. I heard a graduate student uh, say, say today when I ran into him, uh, I said, are you going to, are you, are you going to be at Arts tonight? He said, I'm at everyone. I'm not missing one. Uh, that's music to my ears because uh, you learn so much hearing artists present, especially those outside of your medium. I've said it over and over, when you listen to artists, you're not just seeing their work, you're understanding how artists live, how they survive economically, you get tips on what type of um, uh, experiences they have, by residencies, 
and collaborations. Uh, it is truly one of the best learning experiences you can have as uh, undergraduate and graduate art students to hear uh, and hear these presentations. So by all means, try to uh, attend as uh, many, of, as many of these talks as you can and resist the urge to only go to ones that are specific to your medium of study. Uh, my last thing before I introduce Jessica Munich-Ganger, who's going to introduce our guest uh, tonight, is this lecture series is student-driven. Um, it didn't exist until the Black and Gold Committee put forth the idea that they wanted a visiting artist uh, series. This drove, uh, this, the, the lecture series, the funds, come from differential tuition. So these amazing artists that we uh, are blessed by seeing every semester, year in, year out, is a student-driven project. Uh, so great round of applause for the students for making this happen. So, uh, up is Jessica Munich Ganger, who's going to introduce her guest tonight. Great. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, I don't know if many of you know, but he is also a colleague in the print narrative forms area, and he teaches digital printmaking and internet print narrative forms. So, woo, my colleague, Nicholas. Um, thank you. And I echo his appreciation for allowing us to. Um, invite some fantastic artists here today and I've been following uh, Charles Finnecke's work for a while and really impressed by his um, prints and overall uh, works on paper and hybrid practices and it's a delight to introduce him this evening. Um, he grew up in Suffolk, Virginia. He earned his BA in Art and Psychology from Kenyon College in 1990. After working as a graphic designer in New York City for four years, he attended the University of Connecticut, where he received his master's in fine arts and printmaking and mixed media. He is a professor of art and printmaking and the printmaking area coordinator at the University of Akron, Myers School of Art in Akron, Ohio. His work is included in numerous national and international collections, including La Biblioteca Nacional de España in Madrid, Spain, the Biblioteca Alexandrina, Alexandria, Egypt, the Frederick and Laura Ruth Bidwell in Peninsula, Ohio, and the Turner Print Museum in California State University in Chico, Chico, California. Recent exhibitions include the East Coast Screen Print um, Biennial, the Art Center of the Capital Region, Troy, New York, Ohio Letterpress, the Morgan Conservatory, Cleveland, Ohio, the Carta Paper Made Biennial International Paper Made Artwork Exhibition in Palazzo Fagazzaro um, in Scoia, um, Italy, <laughs> under pressure contemporary printmaking and changing landca landscapes in Merrimack Gallery of Contemporary Art, St. Louis Community College, St. Louis, Missouri. And Charles Binnicky accumulation and installation in two parts, the Lost Coast Culture Machine, Fort Bragg, California. So please welcome Charles as he discusses uh, radiative forcing, the development of ideas, issues, <laughs> driving, and aspirations for his artwork. introduction and uh, thanks so much for having me here this evening um, it's a it's a real honor to be here with a list of uh, such respected artists for the arts now lecture series and I wanted to thank Jessica and Nicholas for um, having me here this evening as well as the students um, so I'll start with a qualifier I gave a lecture at the uh, at Houghton College about a year and a half ago. Houghton College is in upstate New York. Um, and at the end of my lecture, um, somebody raised their hand for the first question, and uh, she said, um, so is there anything uplifting about your art? So, um, I don't know, perhaps be prepared for doom. <laughs> um, it's a good way to start off the semester's lecture series. Um, so. Um, my work, uh, I address climate change in my work, um, or uh, global warming. It's a term that 
Um, we hear these two terms, and sometimes we think of them as interchangeable, sometimes not. Um, it's kind of, there's kind of an interesting history in that um, climate change was uh, a term that was constructed um, by politicians uh, because they thought that it might be more palatable um, than uh, global warming. They thought it sounded less threatening. Um, so, I am passionate about the environment. Um, I love the environment because of uh, my history um, growing up um, on the edges of peanut fields and hiking around in the woods and uh, hiking in the mountains and uh, spending time with my grandfather um, in his garden or my mother um, in hers, uh, watching my aunts with rose gardens, um, hiking around with the Boy Scouts, um, in addition to the time that I've had with my children. Um, so when I started to um, hear things coming into the news a number of years ago about global warming, um, I sort of turned the other way. I didn't really want to think about it um, because it kind of hit me in the heart a little bit too much. Um, but the more and more that I heard about it, um, the more I felt like it was maybe something that I should address because the landscape, the environment, was something that was so important to me um, that I felt like it was something that I had to speak about. So I wanted to start tonight by showing you a recent piece so you have a sense of where I am now. Um, and uh, before I take you back a few years and talk about um, how this body of work began and um, the influences um, that have played into it. Um, so the title for my um, talk that I gave uh, Jessica was Radiative Forcing. Um, I came across that term a number of years ago when I was starting to do research into um, the uh, language um, and the meaning and um, all of the science behind um, understanding what global warming or climate change was. So radiative forcing, it's the strength of drivers of climate change is quantified or is quantified as radiative forcing. A radiative forcing is the change in energy flux caused by a driver. Um, so I've got a couple different definitions pulled from a couple different places in the International Panel, or excuse me, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, and from a couple different reports that they produced. Um, and the second one, a measure of influence a factor has in altering the uh, balance of incoming and outgoing energy in the Earth's atmosphere, Earth atmosphere system, um, and is an index of the importance of the factor as a potential climate change mechanism. And so all of this is, we're talking about measurements um, that uh, started um, after the Industrial Revolution. One more quote that I thought helped clarify things um, from the report that was published in 2013. The total, total radiative forcing um, that we're experiencing or observing um, is positive and has led to an uptake of energy by the climate system. The largest contribution to total radiative forcing is caused by the increase in atmospheric concentrations of, of CO2 since 1750. So when I start to when I, I came across this term, a measure of the effect, um, I started to think about what is my radiative forcing? What is my effect personally? Because I am here, I'm a part of this system, I'm a player in this game. And then I started to think about what are the forces of the drivers in my life. So, one of the things that you're supposed to do when you start an artist talk is show a picture of yourself as a child or a picture of your kids. Um, so I decided that instead I would show you Duncan Leach. He was my neighbor. This is his fifth grade picture. And the reason I'm showing you Duncan is that uh, he was one of the uh, people that kind of put the fire under my butt in terms of art. Duncan's mother was an artist. She was kind of this weird person in town. People liked her, but she was a little bit of an anomaly. Um, and uh, so Duncan and his brother Zan were always drawing. One day I went over to Duncan's house, and he had drawn the most amazing raccoon that I'd ever seen in my entire life. And I thought, this is what I want to do. Um, I want to be able to draw raccoons like that. Um, so, now, here I am. <laughs> uh, so, 
I will show you a family picture. I'm from Suffolk, Virginia. And um, in Suffolk, everybody wears sweaters, except for small red-headed children, and we make them wear plaid. <laughs> <laughs> so my house was a little bit strange, too, um, in the sense that my mom uh, had taken piano lessons since she was a child, and she loved classical music. And there weren't a lot of other people in town who loved classical music. Suffolk was not, like, completely the sticks, but Classical music aficionados were not in um, numerous quantity in town. Um, and she continued to take piano lessons um, and play all through my childhood. So when I would come home from school sometimes, she would play the piano. This was one of her pieces that she would play. Um, and you would just kind of go into the living room um, and sit down and listen. Um, she, when my parents built the house that we lived in, they put speakers in the ceiling in the kitchen, which was really strange for back then. And you would sometimes come home from school and the house would really be shaking um, with like Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky and like really big music, um, full tilt on the volume while she was, um, I don't know, canning or fixing supper or simply waiting for us to get home from school. Um, so um, I was exposed to art in that way um, and gained a real appreciation from those people that lived around me um, who were producing art um, and also that kind of appreciation that I saw within my own house. Um, so, in terms of the body of work that I'm talking about, um, we'll go back to 2004. Um, so, I had a residency at the Gentile Arts, uh, um, Gentile Artist Residency um, in Laramie, or excuse me, in Sheridan, Wyoming, outside of Sheridan, Wyoming. Um, and during that time, I decided that I was going to really push myself with painting. Um, and so I bought a couple sheets of plywood, um, had them cut up, and primed them all, and set, put myself on a, on a regimen of trying to um, paint at least four quick landscapes a day. Not necessarily quick, because I worked all day long on them, but relatively short in terms of what some people might spend. But just through that action of, of really pushing myself um, on one observation, the landscape um, at that point took on a real importance to me because my mother had died the previous, um, uh, just after Christmas the previous year. Um, and we had lived in Laramie, Wyoming, and had spent a lot of time driving around the mountains when, when my parents would come visit. Um, and my mom used to love to go out and sit in our front yard at sunset. Um, we lived on one of the only hills in Laramie, and so we had this sort of view across everybody's roofs. And the sky would just come alive. Um, in the evening, she would call it. Let's. You know, she would ask me to go watch the fireworks with her, and we would sit and watch um, as this kind of magic unfolded in front of us. Um, so when I started to approach um, the landscape, um, I and and being back in Wyoming, I had moved to Akron, Ohio since that time. Um, I was really um, struck by how. In the, the western landscape, you can look in one direction and you have one kind of environment happening in front of you, and in another direction, things look com completely different. Um, I was struck by how sort of constant and steady the land was, and seemingly unchanging, um, but how the sky was just continuously evolving. So what I started to do was think about capturing um, those moments of change, where things were just so kind of beautiful, and um, they sort of took you away from yourself for a few minutes. And I started to you know, think that, um, about the kind of real sort of, uh, of peace and release of the rest of the world that you kind of feel when you're completely struck by those moments in the landscape around you. Um, the, excuse me, <laughs> is this too close up here? The, uh, um, so the following year I went, I was lucky enough, or excuse me, that previous spring I had been lucky enough to go um, on a trip to Egypt, a group of printmakers um, traveled to Egypt together for an exhibition um, at the American University in Cairo, and, um, and then down to Luxor um, to see a lot of the sites. Um, when I was there, I was really struck by the kind of ornamentation um, that I saw in a lot of mosques, and the crazy busyness of the city but then the incredible peace that you felt when you were in certain environments within the city. Um, I was also listening to uh, a contemporary musician, um, Arvo Pärt, 
a lot at that point, and specifically a piece um, of his called Lemontate. Um, it was a, a sort of a lament, um, and it was very interesting to me because it was um, very discordant in moments, um, and very um, sort of, then there would be these beautiful swells of kind of harmony, but there was often this sort of constant meter pacing through the piece. Um, I was still thinking a lot about the landscape, um, and so started to think of all of these things together, like pulling all of these influences from different parts of my life. This is a piece that was called um, For What Was, But Will No Longer Be. Um, so I took, you know, the, I tried to create um, this piece that had a kind of musical character to it, um, with this uh, sort of measured, metered, but slightly irregular grid, um, and then pulling in landscapes from pivotal points in my life. Um, I was also, at this point, in the winter in um, Akron, Ohio, which is really long and gray, and um, the trees just seem to be sort of yearning um, to grab hold. I, I began to think of them as kind of fingers and seeming to try to, try to root themselves into the sky. So, all of these pieces coming together to talk about that kind of constant meter of life and the rises and swells that we have at certain moments. So, I started um, to, at this point, kind of look at other aspects of the landscape. But up until this point, I'd been looking from afar. Um, and I started to think about the environment that was surrounding me um, in terms of its closeness in proximity. Um, and again, thinking about those things in the environment that, um, that change really quickly, um, and, but are perhaps constant in some ways. Um, like the surface of the water, which can be incredibly placid at times, um, but then also um, violent um, and uh, disruptive. Um, so, working on a series of images that were all photographed from the same spot, but under different circumstances. Um, these are a series of photogravures, um, and uh, I called the group uh, Slack Tide. The Slack Tide is that moment between uh, when the tide is coming in and when the tide is going out, when there's a moment of complete pause. Um, I saw these as like sort of pauses, captured moments um, that uh, illustrated the different characters of the water. So then another project that started to come along at this time um, was uh, the Akron Art Museum uh, built a new addition. Um, and when it opened, one of the other community art spaces um, hosted a show where they asked people um, to do something about the sky. The building had been designed by um, an Austrian um, architect um, and his firm, which was called Coop Himmelblau, uh, which means blue sky. Um, so I had been flying on this uh, when I came back from Wyoming on that trip that I mentioned to you. Um, I, it was this amazing flying day, and the sky was just filled with all of these amazing clouds, but it was kind of constantly changing. So again, I was looking at that sort of constant presence, but how it changed and evolved. Um, I feel like the sky is all about possibility, about what could be. Um, it seems to have no limits, um, and it's changing all the time. So what I decided to do was to pair images, photogravures of the sky um, with words um, that were kind of indeterminate. They seemed to imply something, but they didn't say anything specifically. Um, to try to lead the viewer um, to kind of make an association, perhaps complete a sentence around that word. So for quite a while, I had been working on bodies of work. And I decided that um, as much as I liked having a body of work, I felt like I was always um, working on a project and then meeting an end and having to kind of start anew on something. So I decided that I wanted to try to work with um, some, a body of work that could be kind of a consistent sort of underlying um, body across a number of years while those other projects might come and go. Um, so, I had been to the uh, Metropolitan Museum, to, and there was a show on Islam in um, Venice, I believe. And one of the things that struck me was in this room with this enormous 
um, uh, oriental carpet, and it was just there was a didactic on the wall describing um, the pattern and all of that. And one of the things it talked about was the modulo minimo. So if you reduce a pattern down to its basest form, um, it's you know the the thing that has to repeat to make that pattern come into um, play. That's what's considered the modulo minimo. So I started to think about well, what are those patterns that happen in life um, that we see that repeat themselves um, over and over? What kind of modulo minimos exist in life? And so this one was about sort of rise and fall. It was around the time of Hurricane Katrina. I was still working with um, images of water as well. Um, and so this was that kind of constant desire for more and more and more, um, while not necessarily thinking about the uh, ramifications. So I started to feel more and more at this time myself like I needed to be speaking about the environment. I had been dancing around issues of it, especially with this image here, um, and wanted to speak about it more. Um, I was on sabbatical, and I was able to travel. I had a residency in Uvaskula, Finland. Um, and before I went to the residency, the cheapest place to fly in and out of in Scandinavia was um, Oslo, Norway. So I decided that what I would try to do is travel around for a week before, do my residency for two weeks, and then travel around for a week after before I headed home. I always try to fit too much into my, um, into my trips, and I get a little bit manic. Um, so. Um, it was really nice to see a lot of places at the beginning, but then stay in one place for two weeks, um, and then see a little more at the end. So, I started out by, um, with uh, a night in Oslo, and then I went to the north of Norway, to Tromso, which is up in the Arctic Circle. Um, it was just before Thanksgiving, and it was starting to get dark, um, and I wanted to experience what um, Arctic climates were like um, when you start to reach that time of the year where the light goes away. I was really hoping to see the Aurora Borealis, but um, it didn't happen. Um, it was really cloudy while I was there. But um, I think that you know, give, even though I, did, I wasn't able to experience that, I spent a few days um, hiking around in the north of Norway in the fog um, with days that sort of where it started to get you know, fairly light around 10, and then about 3 o'clock in the afternoon it was starting to get um, pretty dark again. So by the time I got to um, uh, Ivaskola, I had been starting to think about the Arctic climates. Um, so one of the things I started to do was look at, um, that they were speaking about in the media at this time was, um, was the decline in the sea ice extent um, in the Arctic. Um, so I wanted to try to find a way that I could communicate um, the um, loss of sea ice that, that was being seen. Um, so the crystal structure of ice is based upon the hexagon. So I decided that if I was going to speak about ice, working with that structural or that shape um, to speak about the kind of structure of this large mass of ice, that the hexagon would be a good idea. So what I chose to do was to um, print um, a lithograph and the lightest areas um, were the sea ice extent in um, 19, um, I believe it was 1992, um, and then it progresses um, to a more vibrant blue um, up until 2007. So this shape is kind of roughly the shape of the sea ice in the Arctic Circle um, at that beginning of that period, and then kind of shrinking it down. I started to think about what are the causes um, what, are, what are things that I'm seeing in my environment um, that are causing um, global warming, that might be causing this loss of sea ice? Um, and one of those, if, um, I'm sure it's much the same here, Akron, Ohio is a, is a rust belt city. Um, and as, you, as I drive to work every day, I see plumes of smoke, especially in the winter, billowing from a factory. Driving up to Cleveland, um, you see it much more. Um, I think that um, there is nothing more terrifying and that billowing smoke and nothing more beautiful. I'm completely captivated by it. I love to watch how it kind of moves um, and evolves and the way light works with it. Um, and then to sort of try to understand clouds um, based upon that. But as you look at them, that smoke is, is dissipating so quickly, um, that, that pollution. 
um, and it's disappearing. But it's that that's the thing that's probably the most lasting in its effect. Um, so with this series called Bloom, um, what I wanted to do was to um, take the thing that was perhaps least tangible physically, um, but going to have possibly the most tangible effect in that environment that I was observing around me. Um, so I isolated the smoke plumes, making them the most solid thing, and getting rid of the rest of the environment. Um, I, these were created with a process called fumage, where I created a stencil, adhered it to the surface of a paper, and then suspend the paper over my head, and ran the surface of a flame across the paper so that the carbon would deposit on the surface of the paper. Um, I really liked the idea that the carbon in which I was speaking about was the thing that I was actually drawing with. Um, so, at this point, I had been trying for a few years because I have been wanting to talk about um, the Arctic environment and to talk about climate change as it was affecting the polar ice caps. Um, but I was feeling like I was looking at everybody else's data. And if I was going to say something about it, then I thought that it would um, have more validity if I was speaking from my personal observations. Um, that it was a little bit disingenuous to speak about it based upon what everybody else is telling me. I wanted to know if I went to the Arctic environment, if I could see um, global warming and climate change for myself. So I began writing grants, um, and I was able to travel um, to Greenland um, in the summer of 2009. Um, and it was the most amazing, magical adventure. Um, I went to Ilulisat, um, which you can see um, sort of in the center on the west coast of Greenland. Um, it's uh, a town of about, I think it's 5,000 people, and I think that there are about 5,000 dogs in the town too. So it's an amazing place when it comes to feeding time. Um, it's a town that has one road that runs through it. Those roads don't connect to anywhere else. Um, and there's um, sort of a dog superhighway that kind of cuts across town so that um, during the winter that the sleds can get out to the ice. Um, the reason that I wanted to go to Ilulisat was to um, see the Jacobshaven Ice Fjord. Um, which is uh, one of the largest contributors um, to glaciers um, in the, uh, the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, so, to get there was quite a chore. I, first of all, I got lucky enough to have the grant funded, um, and I left in um, late June, right around um, the equinox. I had to fly to Reykjavik, um, Iceland, um, and then fly back, but actually I don't think I really flew back, I think that we just vibrated. Um, from Reykjavik to Greenland in this prop plane um, where you're really just kind of shaking the entire way. I love to take pictures out of plane windows. Um, I know everybody does, but I can't stop myself. Um, and it was really exciting to have sort of seen Greenland from way up high when I was on my way to Reykjavik um, and then see it start sneaking back in um, as I flew into Lulaset. When you When I arrived there, I discovered this land that was, um, was just all rock and ice. Um, the largest trees that they have are maybe this tall, um, and they're sort of like birches and willows. Um, I was amazed because the environment um, around the perimeter, um, where you have rocks and um, very um, low plants, mosses and, and um, sort of alpine plants, I was surprised at how familiar it felt because of my time living in Wyoming and hiking in the alpine um, meadows in the mountains. It was amazing because um, during the night, the sun never set. And I knew this when I was going, but it was the strangest thing. It just sort of, the sun just kind of went in a circle around the sky above you. And it got more dim, and the light became really um, incredibly rich and warm. Um, but uh, the light never went away. So this is the Jacobshaven Ice Fjord. Um, so an ice fjord is, um, is like a fjord that like, you might know about in places like Norway, these sort of um, tongues um, that work up into uh, the valleys and rocks into the coast. 
but with an ice fjord, um, it's completely covered with ice flow. Um, so that when you look at environments like this, um, it's not a solid sheet of ice. It's not a solid, it looks as though it's a solid field, um, but it's actually um, ice that's all broken up and is slowly moving out to sea. Um, I think it was about 60 kilometers inland where the glacier was calving, um, and then sort of slowly moving out to sea. So when you're looking at this um, image here, um, this uh, kind of right up above me, it looks pretty small because there's nothing there for us to compare it to, but um, this you know, huge iceberg there is about 200 meters high. Um, so it's kind of breathtaking in its scale, and at the same time you don't really, you know, even though you're standing there, it's kind of hard to fathom how, how immense it is. And it's very disorienting because when you look at it, at the, uh, the landscape in front of you, nothing is moving. But you sort of get a sense that something just moved over here. And so you look over there and there's nothing moving. But then you catch something moving over here. So you sort of sense the movement in your peripheral vision, but what you're focusing on um, seems to be really stable. So it's a really disconcerting um, kind of situation. So I spent a day hiking along the ice fjord um, uh, with a guide who was Danish. Um, uh, and uh, then my computer's thinking. There we go. Um, and then the, uh, the following day, I was able to um, take a midnight ride out in the glaciers on a boat. Um, and then the following morning, um, travel from uh, Iluliset, which is down here. You can see the ice fjord, this kind of tongue of ice working its way out. Um, and then I went further up north on a boat again um, to um, Ecli, which is, uh, was the base camp for the polar explorer, the French polar explorer, Paul Emile Victor. Um, it was really amazing in both those instances being out in, I mean, the first night I was out in a small wooden boat with all of these icebergs. And, get out there and you feel like this is just wrong. Um, I know about the Titanic and I know what could happen. Um, but it's really, it, it, and the, you know, the boat is bumping up against the, these you know, chunks of, of ice the whole time. Um, on the trip further north, you just kept passing these massive icebergs floating by until you reached the face of this glacier um, as it was, um, uh, the ice sheet was sort of slowly migrating out to sea. Um, they took the boat up as close as they could so that you could sort of sit and wait and possibly see um, the glacier calve, but they couldn't go but so close because when it did calve, it would cause the sea to heave. Um, and you, it would calve and you would sort of sit there for a minute and then you would slowly start rising up and down um, with all the ice around you. Um, it was also, it was really interesting because very often you would, there was nothing seeming to happen kept hearing what sounded like cannon fire around you. Um, and it was these uh, pockets of air being released in the glacier somewhere back behind the front um, as it was sort of starting to slowly break free. So um, this is the camp where we went. If you look really closely, you can see those little red huts um, on the hill there. Um, so I stayed a night here. Um, and was able to hike up onto the moraine, um, the deposit of gravel that had accumulated from all the years of the progress of um, the face of this glacier um, as it moved uh, out to sea and slowly broke off. Um, hike up on top of it and really look down below. And then the following day, we hiked up um, to the uh, edge of the glacier, or of the ice sheet, um, and uh, set up camp before hiking out onto the inland ice. Um, so as we hiked up, you sort of continue to go up and up and up, um, and it becomes kind of rockier and rockier, and you see less vegetation. And then suddenly you realize that you're actually on the glacier, even or the ice sheet, even though you don't really realize um, that you're there. Um, you start to feel, see like the ground kind of glowing beneath you. Um, there's a kind of a fine layer of gravel that's settled on top, and you can see the ice um, below it. From there, we hiked about two miles out onto the, uh, the ice sheet, 
Um, I was with two guides, um, one Nicolas um, and the other David. And uh, Nicolas had this pole that he carried with him. And he was continuously poking the ground in front of us to make sure that we were walking on ice. Um, because if we walked on snow, there was possibly a crevasse underneath that we could fall into. Um, so the entire experience was just exhilarating, not only because what I was seeing, but because like my mind was just completely on fire with um, you know, excitement, a little bit of fear, how beautiful it was, um, and having dreamed about being in this place for so long. So as we hiked out, I noticed these really beautiful cylindrical holes on the surface of the ice. Um, and Nicolas told us that we had to look for those, that we had to hike where we saw those holes. Um, and uh, the reason that we had to hike where they were is that they only occurred on ice. They don't occur on snow. So if you saw them, you knew that you were on um, solid footing, that you didn't have to worry about things caving underneath you. Um, so these holes were called, are called cryokinites. You can see that they start as really small, and then they slowly grow um, in their diameter. What happens is um, particulates from the atmosphere, whether it's dust that's picked up from a storm, um, or uh, carbon, um, or other pollutants in the atmosphere falling on the surface of the ice, those particles that fall on the surface of the ice are darker in color. Because they're darker in color, they draw heat, and they start to melt down into um, the ice, forming these really beautiful little cylinders. Um, and then they slowly start to grow and grow and grow. If you reach down into those holes and felt it, you wouldn't even be able to feel the sediment that you can see that's black down in the bottom. Um, but those tiny particles um, have a pretty profound effect. So those particles start to build and build um, and gather and form lakes. The lakes get bigger and bigger and they start to form rivers. Um, and then they start to form what are called moulins. A moulin is a drainage tube that plunges to the base of the ice sheet and lubricates it and causes it to start um, to move faster. Um, so I had gone to Greenland because I wanted to see if I could see climate change for myself and that was pretty much the first thing that I saw when we stepped onto the surface of the ice. Now those particles would be there naturally because of dust and it might be because of volcanic action. Um, but we also know that those particles are there in part because of the carbon that we're putting into the environment. Um, and I thought it was so strange that they were this like really beautiful thing that grabbed my eye first that I was really captivated by. Um, when this was taken, um, Nicolas poked with a pole all around this tube. He heard, we heard it first, um, and then he started looking for it. Um, and we wanted to film it, both David and I, um, but we couldn't get over on the other side where the light would have been better um, because he, could, he was poking around and he could tell that there was only snow over there. Um, so they um, grabbed hold of my backpack and I leaned over it um, to look down in it. Um, and um, yeah, that was crazy. Um, but it was right there in front of me. Um, so when I got back to the base camp, one of the things that they had there was um, uh, photographs from Paul Emil Victor's original um, polar explorations. Um, and this was one of them, um, where looking out from the camp across the bay, um, you could see the glacier front um, and the ridges of the mountain behind it. Now the perspective is slightly different here, but you can see the entirety of that slope as it um, moves down into the bay, um, whereas here, you know, we see that tongue moving completely out. So, moulins and the lubricating of the base of the ice sheet, um, that's one problem. But another problem in terms of the melt um, is that as the glacier breaks free and moves faster, um, it's moving out over water. And that water is able to um, allow the glacier to move faster as well. So when I got back from this amazing trip, there were like crazy things that happened there. Um, I, you know, I ended up staying up really late with um, a pair of ornithologists from the Cornell um, Ornithology Laboratory, I believe it's called, who were there doing bird counts. 
Um, the night that I went out into the bay um, on this boat, um, we were kind of cruising along and we started to hear music. It was really strange. Um, and then we realized it sounded a little bit um, Asian. Um, and then we realized it was choral music. And then it turned into a spiritual. Um, and then we approached a boat and it was a Danish women's choir singing spirituals in the disco bay um, in, uh, you know, on the coast of Greenland. Completely bizarre but magical experience. Um, so, um, or the fact that when I was staying at that um, base camp um, at Ikli, um, I had some of the best Thai food that I've ever had because there was a Thai woman who had married a man from um, Denmark who, and they decided to move to Greenland and she became the chef for this camp. Um, so, um, I don't know, I think one of the things that's so magical about travel is all the things that happen that you don't expect that end up kind of playing into your, into your ideas. So when I returned, um, I had the opportunity to have an exhibition um, in uh, one of the galleries at the University of Akron. Um, and the exhibition um, suddenly became much longer because the person who was after me um, had canceled their exhibition. So my show was going to be up for three months. Um, and this was a gallery. It's a gallery, but it's also kind of a passageway between two different parts of, of the campus that gets a lot of traffic. And I felt like, you know, if I'm going to have my work here, I don't want people walking through for three months and getting bored by my work. So I decided what I would do is um, an installation, but have that installation um, change over the course of the three months. Um, and use that as an opportunity to talk about the change in the environment that was so troublesome to me. Um, so at this time, I'd also um, recently changed the curriculum for the printmaking area at our school. And one of the new projects that I had decided to do was um, a wallpaper project. Um, and it was going to be a reduction relief print. I wanted my students in printmaking to exper experiment um, and understand what it was to produce a consistent edition. But I, another thing that I wanted them to understand over the course of the semester was what happens when you use printmaking not to produce a singular image, but to produce components um, that uh, come together to create a larger piece. So with, for this wallpaper project, they had to produce an addition of 12 images that could then be tiled together um, to create a repeating pattern. Um, I had already started talking a little bit about patterns in my work, so it was also something that I was interested in. I figured I needed to do um, a, a, a sample um, so that I could show them what I was, um, what I was hoping that they would accomplish. Um, and instead of doing an edition of 12, I totally turned on the printmaking geek and uh, produced 175, um, and then ended up wallpapering the gallery um, uh, with this pattern. I wanted to produce a pattern that was, um, had a kind of decorative feel to it, um, so that it felt it had a kind of familiarity, um, you know, a kind of color palette that you might see in some designery kind of space, something that had sort of a floral quality, but that when you looked at it more closely, um, you realized that it wasn't exactly what you thought it was. Um, so these kind of billowing smoke plumes um, uh, covered the wall on one side of the gallery. Um, on the other side of the gallery, I had knitted this huge cloud of smoke that I had kind of tacked to the ceiling. Um, first of all, um, okay, so, well, the idea behind the knitting, I had been thinking about the fact that um, this point that we've reached in terms of climate change, we didn't reach it because of anything, I think, intentional. I think there are people out there who just don't care, but I don't think anybody sort of set out, um, you know, to destroy the environment. Um, I started to think about the repetitive action um, that um, was required to create the effect. Um, and I was thinking about with, you know, with a net, with knitting, um, it's constructed one stitch at a time, um, but that it comes together to create this larger form. I also was thinking about the fact that it's, a, it's an act of comfort, um, that there is comfort in the repetitive action um, that when, uh, when you're knitting, but then that there's also, it's producing these things um, that kind of create warmth and comfort. 
So I was thinking about um, knitting as sort of analogous for, um, or, or as a metaphor for how we were um, creating this problem um, in our environment, but not necessarily willfully. Um, on the wall, across from the wallpaper, I had photographs that I had taken in Greenland. So, what I decided I wanted to do was um, start to um, change the wallpaper. So I started screen printing the knitted pattern over tiles and swapping them out. Um, so I would go over every other day and switch out a few more. Um, and as I did that, I started unraveling the, the cloud that I had knitted into this kind of pile on the floor. Um, and then those the, uh, the knitted pattern started to kind of multiply um, and uh, cover that pattern that was on the wall more and more. Slowly pulling the, the cloud apart, whoops, until the wall was completely covered. And then I started um, to I also um, screen print the, this kind of knitted pattern over top of or on pieces of acetate and then placing those in the frames so that it was obscuring the images um, that were there. Um, I had uh, painted um, the smoke plumes on large panels that were hung along the wall, um, and then I then swapped those out with paintings of the surface of the water, um, and then drew over the center one, and um, that center image was um, had a, a, a small screen mounted on it with um, a film of the ice moving that I had filmed when we were out um, in the Disco Bay. So talking about how that kind of consistent um, practice, um, that repetition, um, has an effect. So I started thinking about the effects. I had been thinking a lot about the effects on the environment. But I also wanted to think about the causes. What's causing this problem? What is it that's causing the cryogenites that I was seeing all over the surface of the snow, of the ice um, on the Greenland ice sheet when I was hiking there? Um, at this time, I was on a residency again in Wyoming. Um, during, this was during the summer of 2012, and it was when there were a lot of wildfires um, uh, in the American West, um, especially Colorado, although there was one wildfire that was about 12 miles from um, where my residency was, so we found ourselves you know, waking up in the middle of the night smelling smoke and then socked in by smoke um, for several days. So I was reading about, um, about the fires um, and about climate change a lot um, at this time. So I started, I found this article and it was all about cause um, and um, our desire to point the finger um, and say this is what caused it. Um, and so in this article it started to talk about proximate cause. Um, so, a quote from the article, what caused the Colorado Springs fire, that spark, wherever it came from, is what triggered the cascading series of events we call a fire. It was what philosophers call a proximate cause, the most immediate, the closest cause. So, that thing, that, that moment, um, that immediate thing that causes the problem. If we look back, we can talk about distal causes. All the other factors being discussed. The intense drought that was covering the state was a distal cause of uh, the Colorado wildflowers. The dead trees that were left behind by bark beetles, um, high winds, those were all distal causes. Those are things that are tightly connected in their effects, um, kind of probabilistic causes. So we've got the proximate, which is really close, the distal, which is a little bit further away. So I started thinking about what was causing the abolition um, or the removal of snow and ice by melting or evaporation um, from the Greenland ice sheet. I started thinking about um, what was happening there that summer, July 11th and 12th of 2012. Um, if you look um, at the image on the left, that's July 8th of 2012. Um, the white is ice that wasn't melting. Um, on July 11th and 12th, almost the entirety of the surface of the Greenland ice sheet was experiencing melting due to the effects of what was called a heat dome. What was the cause of that? Um, this is um, July 15th and 16th of that summer, um, when we see a 50 square mile ice island 
that calves from the Peterman, the Peterman Glacier. Two years before that, it was a 100 square mile um, ice island, four times the size of Manhattan, that broke off of the Peterman Glacier. What was it that was causing this? What was it that was causing um, the massive shrinking in the sea ice extent? So then we get to ultimate causes. Our intuitions tell us that distal causes are in many ways more satisfactory explanations. They tell us something about the meaning of events, not just the mechanisms, which is why they are also called ultimate causes. Um, and that's what we usually want. We want to know what ultimately causes these problems. So when people say, um, did climate, that's, that's what the you know, kind of questions like, did climate change cause this or that? Um, is people wanting to understand what the ultimate cause is. Now part of the problem is like, is changing our minds about things. Um, when we pay attention, we tend to want to pay attention to information that reinforces what we, what we already know, um, and we want to dismiss the things um, that, uh, that are hard to deal with. Just like I had early on in the days when I started hearing more and more about global warming. Um, so we kind of have to battle that. So in terms of those wildflowers, you know, we are the spark. We are the molecule of carbon that settles on the ice. And it may be unpalatable, but all the indications are that we are that ultimate cause. So it brings me back to the, the factory, the smoke plumes um, outside of uh, Folk Hall at the Meyer School of Art at the University of Akron. Um, where I park my car and look at them every day. So um, those are something that influence me in my work, among other things. My influences come from that research, um, but that it, it also comes from uh, everything from uh, you know what's considered fine art or the history of the graphic arts to popular culture. Um, so everything from Albrecht Dürer, um, I'm. Really, you know, I guess it's the same kind of thing as the smoke plumes captivating me coming out of the factories. Um, in Dura's work, I'm really just amazed by the way he um, works with, uh, with um, clouds and smoke in the sky to kind of set a tone um, and environment in his images. Um, but he also uses them um, as narrative devices to help carry the viewer's eye across the picture plane, um, to create visual breaks. Um, I was mentioning this in a class earlier today. When you look at a graphic novel, we have the, you know, the, each cell is, is a box, maybe, um, and there's white um, space between each of those cells. Um, and I think that in some ways, that's one of the uh, things that Durer is doing with the smoke that weaves his way through some of his images in the apocalypse um, to sort of describe different moments um, in Revelations. Um, lost. Um, I. I think the black smoke was just about the scariest thing, um, and also um, completely beautiful and, uh, and um, wonderful to watch. Um, I think it was you know, this way of, of communicating something, uh, a kind of a fear that we can't really put our fingers on. Um, this is uh, a, a video by Duncan Sheik, um, uh, and when I saw this, it was, uh, I guess he wrote a musical um, that has never been um, produced. Um, but, in the, but he did produce a video for a song called Earthbound Starlight, I believe. Um, and in the background, um, there's this sort of oil kind of cascading through. Uh, this is an artist named Yari Hanpara, um, who was a Finnish artist. I saw um, an exhibition of his work when I was in Finland. Um, he creates these incredible constructions in the middle of the room, um, and uh, they're animated, um, they're kinetic works that he puts lights inside so that the walls all around the rest of the space are in a constant state of change. Um, and uh, really sort of intangible and looks as though something's happening, but you can't necessarily put your finger on it. Um, I look a lot at the environment around me. Um, several summers in a row, um, uh, we would have at least one or two storms 
um, that would come across the Great South Bay, um, south of Long Island, um, and then progress across Fire Island, where my wife's family um, has a beach house. Um, and it would look as though kind of death was marching right towards you as these huge fronts would roll in. So, and like I mentioned, I'm influenced a lot by my research. Um, when I was in the things that I'm reading, when I was in Wyoming um, that summer, there was an article that came out in, in Rolling Stone that got a fair bit of acclaim. Um, and it was about um, the, uh, it was titled The Global Warming's Terrifying New Map. There were three numbers to consider that they wanted us to think about. The first of those was two degrees Celsius. Um, we can't raise the temperature of the Earth more than two degrees without disastrous effects. Um, since the idea of a cap was set in 2009 at the failed COP15 United Nations Climate Change Conference, we've already seen a 0.8 degree Celsius rise. And it's anticipated that if we don't stop increasing carbon emissions now, the temperature will still rise another 0.8 degrees Celsius from the warming effects of already released carbon dioxide. So this is um, a, a print that I produced after um, I was uh, in Greenland. Um, I was trying to um, do several things. I was trying to communicate um, the kind of effects of global warming and the, that, you know, the relationship um, between what we are doing um, and its distant effect um, that was causing the melt in the ice sheet. Um, so, I also wanted to play around with combining. I, I've always been interested in printmaking. I haven't talked about much about my interest in printmaking, but printmaking is this kind of umbrella category. Um, we have so many diverse media. It's kind of the living history of the graphic arts. Each of the processes um, that printmaking, that kind of fall under printmaking, um, have different characteristics. And I feel like each of those processes you know, kind of embodies a different voice. So I've always been interested in trying to combine the different processes together um, to try to talk about different sides of an issue. Um, I feel like uh, relief printing speaks in this very sort of direct kind of way, um, whereas um, intaglio um, is much um, sort of more romantic and um, all about um, sort of chiaroscuro and, and beautiful ranges in value, um, whereas there's, with screen printing, there's this kind of stereotype that it's flat. Um, it's a stereotype, but there is that kind of ability to use it um, in that way. So in this piece, I wanted to also try to play around with um, uh, incorporating, um, bringing in uh, digital printmaking. So um, this combines a digital print with a relief um, that I screen printed over and then sheen collate on and then again screen printed on top um, this pattern of molecules um, that are there in the proportion um, of the greenhouse, the three major greenhouse gases um, that we create in terms of, of, of our activity. So that is, those would be carbon dioxide, um, uh, methane, and nitrous oxide. Wanted to talk again, speaking about the kind of distant effects that we have with um, our use uh, um, of fossil fuels. But also, when I was in Greenland, um, they were starting to talk about wanting to drill in Greenland. Um, and part of the problem is, is, is regulation um, and you know, what would happen if it started. Um, so that was uh, something that I was addressing in this image. Again, where I'm combining screen print um, and then with a layer of inkjet underneath. So the second number to consider, 565 gigatons. That's the amount of carbon dioxide humans can add to the atmosphere by mid-century with the hope of staying below two degrees self, the two degrees Celsius cap. Um, so this image combines lithography um, with uh, a photo intaglio um, polymer plate um, that's sheen plate on. That's the uh, iceberg in the dome um, and then uh, screen printed the, uh, the net that's printed over top, this kind of net that we're casting across the world um, with our actions. Um, in this image, I was kind of talking about sort of capturing the magic, trying to freeze those moments in time, um, but then also 
um, you know, talking a little bit about ideas of, of you know, how do we save things? Can we really um, save things? Can we stop it? Another image where I'm combining um, inkjet, in this case lithography, and then screen print over top. Um, so one of the things that um, I'm, I'm interested in in my work is not just talking about um, how kind of terrifying all of this math is or the prospect that, that we have, but also uh, about talking about the things that I see as beautiful. I think that um, the kind of violent action of storm clouds, uh, the sort of turbulent sky, is something that's really beautiful, but also has a really menacing kind of quality. So that third number is um, 2,795 gigatons, and that's the amount of carbon contained in the coal, oil, and gas reserves of fuel companies and countries like Kuwait and Venezuela that act like fossil fuel companies. This is the carbon dioxide that will be produced from the fuel we are planning to burn. Um, so that's over five times that amount. Um, it's a terrifying prospect to me, which speaks to the need um, for us to uh, kind of take a stance and think about what we can do individually. So I wanted to talk about um, the kind of collection that we're building up um, in, in the sky, in the heavens, over our earth. So this is um, a piece that's about um, 10 feet tall and 12 feet wide. Um, there are individual sort of shapes that reference the shapes of molecules. Um, that are again created by running smoke over the surface of a piece of paper, um, trying to imply this kind of collection, this buildup that's happening. Um, when I, uh, a number of years ago, I was, uh, my work at that point was a little bit more related um, to the uh, food and the human body um, and kind of consumption and digestion of food as a metaphor for how we consume life and how everything that we consume affects who we are. Um, I was in uh, Canada, at, in Montreal, at McGill University, um, at the Osler Libra Library of Medical History, looking at um, old illustrations of the human body and um, how it was treated. Um, and one of the things I came across was um, these incredible illustrations of how um, the body was to be healed. And in the illustrations, they showed the people who were sick or who were injured in some way, um, but they never showed the practitioners. Um, they had these disembodied pairs of hands that would be pushing the body or pulling the body in certain directions to show what the practitioner was supposed to do. And I always found that really interesting. Um, and so I've, I've started um, at this point and continue to work with this idea of, of these kind of disembodied hands um, that are manipulating um, the, the smoke, the carbon, um, the pollution, um, and trying to create the question of, you know, are these, the, are these hands contributing um, to the problem, or are they healing? Um, sort of trying to ask the viewer, what is your role here? What are you doing? This is another piece where I've got um, uh, creating a kind of wallpaper pattern. Um, it seemed that for a while I was just noticing pump jacks everywhere. You see them um, in the American West pretty clearly because they're you know, out in the middle of fields. Um, but in my region of the country where there's a lot more trees, you know, sometimes you suddenly notice them kind of hidden behind something. Um, so I wanted to talk about their uh, constant presence. This is a piece combining screen print and a polymer photograph here talking about um, the uh, prevailing winds and the fact that in Northeast Ohio, um, while we're not belching out as much pollution as we once were, we're continuing to do so. And that um, pollution um, moves up into the prevailing winds, which moves across Canada. You know, we don't have to worry about it here because it's gonna go somewhere else, right? But then it's traveling up across, up across the, uh, the polar regions and settling on the ice sheet. Um, and that red line that you see progressing across there um, is a representation of the increase in um, carbon concentration in the atmosphere. Um, so, in uh, that going? Um, for a while, I had been wanting. i had been playing uh, for a couple months at that point. I've been playing around with um, instead of uh, well, for a while, I had been working with printing components. 
Um, and there was an exhibition um, in Youngstown um, of uh, printmaking work, and I was, I submitted um, some singular images to the exhibition, but what I really wanted to do was have the opportunity to work on the wall um, and Well, there we go. All right, to work on the wall and create a piece um, in that space. And that proposal was accepted. Um, uh, we had also recently gotten a, a laser cutter at school that I was really excited um, in terms of working with for cutting paper, but also cutting matrices for printmaking. Um, so I uh, had the opportunity to go into the space at Youngstown uh, State um, at the McDonough Museum and create this work on the wall, which was Again, it's, I think it's about eight feet tall in this instance um, and about 12 feet wide. And it was created out of a lot of different components. Um, it was created out of um, a screen printed paper, um, paper that I had done mono prints on and then cut up, um, and then a lot of uh, laser cut paper um, as well as um, some tar paper. Um, I was, you know, after I made this piece, because I liked the structural character of tar paper and the color, um, I began to think more and more about what I was, you know, what the materials were that I was using. Um, and so, um, it's pushed me more to use only um, paper that's uh, recyclable. I don't feel really comfortable creating waste using materials that are, are going to continue to cause a problem. Um, so this is, uh, thinking more about those smoke plumes that, that um, have always interested me. I wanted to also think about other ways that we're polluting, um, and that's with our words um, and our explanations and our um, uh, kind of misguided representations that people put out there. Um, so this was a, a project for um, a portfolio called the Tabloids, um, and what I decided to do was use um, text from the Heartland Institute, which is an organization of climate um, science, climate change deniers, um, and it was filled with, you know, kind of crazy statements that um, are misleading and as problematic um, in ways as the pollution itself. Um, so this is the image that um, was a part of the kind of center, the center of that um, tabloid. Um, but then I wanted to play around with it further, and so I separated it out into colors, and that's the image that's on the poster that you guys see. So I was thinking a lot about accumulation, accumulation of, uh, of uh, pollution, but also accumulation of our words and how things were um, building up and contributing to a problem. Um, this is an exhibition um, that was, it was called Accumulation, an exhibition in two parts. Um, I worked on creating um, these large scale drawings um, where I was building up pattern. I mean, kind of thinking about how we can build up and cover up and pretty up and use great color and um, use kind words, but we're not necessarily, or gentler language, but we're not necessarily solving the problem. Um, so then the second half of that exhibition, um, I was um, kind of taking that idea that I had been considering further and used it um, to expand upon the, the kind of wall drawing that I had been doing before. Um, so on the left is a wallpaper pattern, um, and then I went into the space with big sheets of repeated patterns that I could then cut up um, and draw across the wall using some of the same components that I'd used before, but uh, then also you know, with the netting, but then also laser cutting new components um, and trying to create this sort of um, menacing bloom. One of the components that I included in the exhibition um, was a trade your carbon for art kind of uh, scenario. So for um, people who attended the exhibition, um, if they wanted to take one of these pieces off the wall um, and have it, they could. Um, but what they had to leave in exchange um, was a card that um, was their commitment to how they were going to reduce their um, carbon footprint, what kind of contribution they were going to make um, to improving um, the climate or, you know, perhaps mitigating the effects that we're seeing. Um, so this is um, uh, a screen print where I was again talking about, whoops, having trouble here, um, where I'm talking about the idea of 
covering things up and prettying them up, but it doesn't change the, the, um, the fact that I, I do pollute. So this um, project here was for the last Southern Graphics. I know that I need to hurry up here. Um, the last Southern Graphics um, conference um, where we were, I was invited to do um, an interactive or a, a public piece. And again, I wanted it to be um, something where the, the public could interact with it. Um, so I printed about 800 cards where I was conjugating the verb um, to pollute. Um, and you could take one. Um, if you tore the top tab off, um, it had information that told you that you should take this card um, and take it into your environment and um, photograph it and hashtag it with I pollute um, to stand as a commitment for how you were going to change your action in your environment. Um, so, kind of also acknowledging that I was, in a way, polluting with um, this project. Um, so the interesting thing that happened here was um, it was supposed to be up for um, about eight hours um, while the conference was in a certain site. Um, so I got up really early, found my spot, um, did my installation, left to have lunch with a friend, came back and showed him, and then saw some other friends and they wanted to see it. So I was like, they were, they were like, where is your piece? And so I walked back over with them. And when I got there, it was completely gone. Um, all 800 cards, all 800 binder clips, um, totally gone. So I created this piece with the expectation that it was going to disappear, that people were going to take it away. Um, but what I didn't expect was the entire thing to disappear like it had never been there. Um, and I guess when you work in the public, like you have to expect that that sort of thing might happen. But it was almost like it had been abducted by aliens. Um, what I later found out, there's a documentary called Vigilante Vigilante that's all about buffers. Buffers are people who clean up street art. They're sort of like street artists who take down street art. Um, and apparently Berkeley has one of the more famous ones, so I like to think that I got buffed. The really um, sad part about it, though, was that the remainder of the, the exhibition I was going to take home and install at another show a week later. So I actually had to go home and reprint the entire thing. Um, but this is what it looked like in its second incarnation. And then this is the piece that, um, that you saw a few minutes ago. So this is in the East Coast screen at Biennial, which opens in a couple days. Um, and uh, it's eight feet tall and um, eight feet wide. Um, they wanted me to produce a large-scale piece, but I wasn't going to be able to go to install it, so I had to sort of think about how can I make this thing, make it transportable, and how can I sort of deal with not wanting to produce waste. Um, so I ended up printing on Tyvek, which is that material that they make envelopes and, and admissions bracelets and wrap houses with, um, because it can be recycled, but it was, it's also fairly stable in its structure, and it could be rolled up um, and sent along. So this is a kind of a close-up view of it. Um, and then this is uh, the most recent piece that I did, where again, I'm trying to think about um, how, what are we doing? How are we manipulating? Um, how are we handling this situation? So, in kind of closing here, if radiative forcing is an index of the importance of a factor as a mechanism for potential change. As an individual, I have to ask myself, and I think that we should all be asking ourselves, what is my net effect as a driver of global warming? How can I reduce my carbon imprint? I think we should all be asking what our own radiative forcings are um, and what my potential is um, as a mechanism for change. So, five minutes over, um, but that's what I have for you. So I'm happy to uh, answer any kind of questions that you guys might have. Um, and if anybody needs a nudge, there's some for you. <laughs> but maybe I'll go back. <laughs> what kind of thoughts do you guys have? Yes. Um, Sorry, this is just a technical question. Uh, was it difficult to print lithography over inkjet? Was there not an issue with the water and ink bleeding, or? Um, you, it depends upon the inkjet um, media that you're using. Um, a lot of the less expensive ones, 
in the past weren't water fast, um, so they might bleed. Um, and actually in those landscapes in the very beginning, I used the bleeding of inkjet to my, to my advantage. I made them bleed. Um, many, most of the inks now, a lot of them, um, are, are water fast, so that if you let them dry, you can then actually soak them in water if you want. But you kind of need to play around with um, the, the ink that you're using to see what's going to happen with it. I think um, I've had actually more trouble with screen printing over top of, um, of uh, like woodcuts and um, different prints that use oil-based inks than I had with that. Other questions? Yes? What is your planning process for a lot of like the wallpaper? Um, well, I start with just working in my sketchbook and sort of drawing and thinking about um, what kind of shapes is it that I'm trying to communicate. Um, uh, and then um, usually once I start to settle on shapes, I'll end up scanning those shapes um, into the computer. And I see um, you know, Photoshop and Illustrator and all that as just drawing tools, so I start to manipulate them. Um, you know, sometimes I trace them directly, um, but other times um, it's, uh, you know, maybe I'm, I'm distorting them and changing the shapes or turning things into halftones um, until I come up with some sort of pattern um, that uh, I feel meets the end that I want. Um, and then you figure out how you're going to make it repeat, um, how you're going to separate out the colors. Um, so, uh, you know, starting in sketchbook, in a sketchbook, but then continuing to kind of sketch with the computer until you come up with um, what you want. The computer is also a great tool for comping things up because you can sort of get a, a sense of what the colors are going to look like when they're on the paper. It always changes to me. Um, you know, maybe it's because there's a subtle difference in color, but also that change in scale. Um, they become kind of completely different things for me. Yes? You mentioned staying up late with some ornithologists. I think, was that in Greenland? Yes. And I wonder if the conversations that you had impacted you in that, will we start to see that kind of content in your work, or are you just going to stick with the sort of ambiance of the environment? You so know, the impact I, of the animals. Yeah. That's a good question. I am kind of obsessed with birds. <laughs> um, I just built... Um, shelves outside of our kitchen window so that the birds feed right on the other side of the window. Um, and I think my wife's becoming even more obsessed than me. Um, I haven't really thought about bringing the animals in specifically. Um, although, you know, that's where we're hearing a lot of uh, troublesome statistics. You know, the whole notion of the polar bear, um, which is kind of the poster child, um, for uh, how climate change is affecting animals, but then um, the birds, I heard a report on NPR the other day about the kind of extreme number of species that are expected to be extinct in the not too distant future because of it. Um, so that's definitely something that um, could play in. Um, I don't have immediate plans for it, but you never know what's going to come Other thoughts? Do you want help? <laughs> yes? Um, how did you go about funding uh, your travels exactly? And then also, how did you, I think you may have covered this briefly, but you know, how did you decide where to go and when? Um, most, all of my travel I funded with grant writing. Um, so, you know, people who think that artists don't need to do things like math and write, um, you're kind of in trouble because artists aren't necessarily making massive salaries, and if you want these fantastic adventures, you have to find a way um, to fund it. So grant writing um, is, is something that has really helped me. Um, and you don't always make the grant on the first shot. You just have to keep trying to revise and, and um, you know, push and strategize to figure out how to make it work. In terms of deciding where I wanted to go, sometimes, you know, a trip, like the trip to Egypt, just kind of happened um, to come along and I was really excited by it, so I really pushed for it. Um, wanting to go to Scandinavia, I'd heard about the residency in Vascula and I knew that that would be a really great 
group of people to work with because I knew some people who knew them. Um, and then, um, and those people who knew them were people I admired, so I wanted to, I, I knew that I would gain a lot by going there um, and having the opportunity to work in a different place. Um, and, you know, in doing a residency or even just traveling to work in a different print shop or with a different group of people is so important because it allows you to step outside of your everyday life. Um, and you're not dealing with those things that you deal with at home. It's not so easy to be distracted by, you know, everything that you have to do on your list. When you're in another place, you're experiencing things in a different way and seeing things differently and um, kind of outside of your uh, everyday environment. So you, in a lot of ways, open yourself up um, to possibility a lot more. Um, so I knew that I was interested in the Arctic environment and how climate change was being affected there. So Yuvaskola and that kind of dovetailed. Um, uh, and I thought it would be a good idea. Um, I traveled to Spain a couple of years ago. and um, I've never had anything against Spain, but I never had a real like urge to go there. But this opportunity came along, and I was invited to visit by a couple of people. Um, and I was able to get funding through school. Um, and the great thing was is that I went and fell in love with the place. So I think that sometimes you really know that something might be good for you, but I think that um, when we you know, take advantage of opportunities, um, sometimes it's, there's a lot to be had that you don't necessarily expect you're going to get you know, by planning something specifically. Other questions? Yes. Do you notice that uh, the work, because there, there seems to be a shift in your work where some of the earlier work was just like this black cloud over an iceberg, and then at a certain point you decided to kind of beautify, you said, to make it look like more colors, more attractive, almost kind of like camouflage in a certain way. Do you notice kind of a different response to your work since you've done that? Are people more easily engaged, or does it, you know, you said like that one woman said, oh, this is so heavy, you know, do you notice any kind of change or shift? Um, yes, I think so. I think that, like, I think with some of the kind of solitary imagery, um, I think there's like, uh, well, I'd like to think that when looking at them that there's like a, a kind of beauty in, in the situation that's being expressed or the environment that I'm representing. Um, but, um, I don't think that there was necessarily as much information to lead and pull the viewer into a discussion with those images. Um, but I think that some of the more recent work that you're talking about, where maybe I am playing around with the idea of you can you know, dress it up and create it up, but it's still there, um, there is like a, a pull because of vibrance of color or um, play of pattern um, that um, is, is maybe a little bit more engaging. Um, if we go back to this piece, this one, I was working on this in the print shop, I got a big reaction from my students on this one, <laughs> they were like, Charles, why are you drawing an afro? <laughs> and then, I forgot about that comment, and let's see if I can get back. I got to here and I finished it and I put it up on the wall and I was like, oh man, I made another afro. Um, so sometimes I guess I'm getting a response from my, uh, from people that, uh, an association that I didn't necessarily expect and it's one that I don't necessarily want, but it does inform me on what I'm doing and make me think about how I have to manipulate things. I saw somebody raise their hand over here. Yes. Yeah. I was just curious if, well, so with um, your piece, the warmer and evolving installation, I thought that was a really great instance of form meeting concept. And I was curious if at all, um, when your interest in the mechanical production of work, if that also was a conceptual um, emphasis on your work, or if that was a sort of experimentation and new technique. Um. Well, I do think, like, one of the things that I was thinking about was the kind of repetitive process that was needed to produce it, mm -hmm. um, and how there is an association with the kind of repetitive process. 
like a singular action isn't necessarily going to cause a problem. Um, you know, like if you're sloppy with ink one day, you get it all over your hands, it's not a big deal. But if you do that every day for the rest of your life as a printmaker, you're probably going to encounter some problems, right? Um, so it's the same kind of thing. There is that, you know, repetitive action that has um, caused and continues to cause the problems that, that, that we're facing in, in the environment. So that's one reason why I feel like printmaking um, is um, kind of an appropriate medium because I am talking about um, the sort of the multiplicity. Um, sorry, I was curious. Uh, I was actually more curious about like, the digital fabrication aspect, the laser cutting and stuff like that, sort of the removal of your own hand from it. Okay. So does that? Um, so the question was was that involved like conceptually as well, or was that just like a, a technical you know sort of way to multitask you know set it up, let it cut it? I think it plays into the repetitive thing, but really um, that was more about um, about how can I you know kind of speed up yeah. my production, um, and I wouldn't be able. It has a lot to do with like the production. Mm -hmm. Because sitting down and cutting out all of those little pieces, um, I wouldn't be able to produce the kind of amount that I needed. But there was this tool that offered me that, that opportunity. Other thoughts? Well, I am up here, so if anybody has questions <coughs> they would like to ask me, um, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much for having me this evening.